And that's why I like it. It's just easier to read. We're doing this to convince ourselves that you can program anything in Yes, and to get, a, to get a sense of the formulas and of what a Turing machine is, and to convince yourselves that Turing machines can really do everything. I mean, look, I really think that's a matter of, of I don't know what, it's a certain maturity to really start believing that Turing machines can do everything, and maybe hours of trying to do everything with them. When I first saw Turing machines, I kind of was convinced they could do everything, because everybody kept telling me they could over and over again, and, you know, I wasn't going to say they couldn't, because I kind of believe they could. But if somebody had said, okay, well, you know, go write the Towers of Hanoi problem on your Turing machine, I wasn't going to be too thrilled about doing that. And neither should you be. <laughs> but, but at some point, you just get to the point where you know, well, I know I can do it. And then you don't have to. <laughs> so, look, it's a hard thing in life, right? I mean, <laughs> the second you know you can do it, you don't have to. But until you've actually done it, you're going to miss some ideas later on if you can't really appreciate how powerful it, it really is. So, Does anyway. Make the claim in his 36 paper that this can do everything. Oh yeah. He does. Oh yeah. Very carefully. <laughs> yes. What kind of arguments does he make? Um, you should read his paper. Actually, it's completely readable. Uh, maybe I'll bring in a copy. Yeah. It was reprinted in a lot of places. Uh, it's readable, and he does explain it. Our book explains uh, why it's similar to other variations, which I'm going to talk about right now. And maybe we can talk briefly why it's a similar to your typical von Neumann RAM CPU architecture, which is what we... Oh, that would be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> no, it would be. That's, that's what your computers are. That means any normal machine language. You know, loading and storing and writing to memory. And... Because it's easier for me to explain that than it is to explain why it's the same as Java. You'd believe that Java is the same as those machine language. All right, all right. You're with me. I, you can't make a joke in this class and get an answer, right? It's like, just let me make the joke, leave me alone. <laughs> Was one of these things built? I mean, he wrote this paper a long time ago. Did someone first build one of these things and then build something more complex? You mean actually build a machine that... No. Not that I know of. No, I can't imagine why anybody would. Well, but, but they didn't um, anything else. I mean, there was nothing. Um, Said, yeah, so this is in, no, but actually, this is in the mid-1930s. So there were, there were kind of electromechanical, Konrad Zeus in Germany, I think, had something, or maybe Iowa? Where was he? <laughs> <laughs> you got to wonder, my, uh, my, my history of computing, is, it's, it's going to change my accent, that's for sure. Uh, I don't really remember the, the very first electronic computer, but certainly by the 40s there were electronic computers. The, um, the ENIAC, uh, Eckert Moshley in University of Pennsylvania was in 46 maybe, 47, 48, something like that. Von Neumann himself, who kind of described the general computer architecture that we more or less use today, he built the machine in 1950 or 51 or so, uh, soon after I think he died. Um, so this is only, you know, 10 years before those actual electronic computers were built. So, we just, we so yeah, so even, even 10 years before that, there were probably electromechanical kind of prototypes that people were... I mean, Charles Babbage in, in 1880 had a mechanical computer that was much more powerful than this Turing machine. Was it general purpose? But it couldn't be more powerful. Well, there was, <laughs> it, it, it wasn't as elementary. It wasn't a Turing machine. It, it was more... Um, it had a mill and a store. He didn't actually finish building it. It was the analytical engine. He lost funding for it. But, but, he, but he built... Uh, are we going to get it? No, no, it's worthwhile. Charles Babbage is a really interesting character. But anyway, in 1880, he, was, he had mechanical plans on paper to build something equivalent to what today is a computer. And it was much more complex in its robustness than a Turing machine. But you're right. It wasn't any more powerful than a Turing machine. But it had a memory and a CPU, and it was similar. It just was mechanical. The one that was built, the one that was built was a difference engine. And that is a special purpose computer that does finite differences, kind of like in a discrete math way. But he had plans on paper for something called an analytical engine, which was a much more general thing that actually read its input and saw a program and executed the program by storing information in the mill, which was the memory, and uh, the store, which was the memory, and the mill, which was the CPU, to do its calculations. So he did have on paper something which never got built. Uh, the thing you see in pictures, the crank thing with all the different posts, that's a difference engine. 
Um, the history is kind of interesting. So, so no, so nobody, nobody saw this theory and said, okay, let's build this and then work our way up to computers. That didn't happen. Maybe Bill Gates before he did Microsoft <laughs> or something. <laughs> He's thinking, oh, this idea isn't going to work. Software, that's it. <laughs> now I'm a billionaire. <laughs> that's the way to go. All right. <laughs> There's a million Turing machine simulators on the web, and some of them are really good. Dimitri, you got one that's really good, right? Yeah, it's set up. You just type, uh, well, be, it's, just go to the web. Go to our web page, right? OK. Yeah, you can run it. OK, so you can run there, and, and, and that will help you, you know, drag your own states around and make your own machines instead of having to do it on paper. And it simulates it, and it shows you the configuration, and, and it, you can go forward and backward probably, right? Yep, you can run it, do everything. Do everything you want. Go wild. Is there a library of functions? There's a few. You can copy and yeah. Good. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about this. I mentioned in advance that all the variations of Turing machines, for the most part, they don't give you anything except convenience. But I want to list some of these and talk about why, at least in principle, they can be simulated by machines that don't have these extra features. And that would, at least intuitively, prove that they don't give you any more power, that they only give you convenience. So let's work with some very easy ones. Option number one. From now on, a Turing machine is allowed, instead of having an R or an L as its third symbol on a transition, it can also have an S for stay where you are. Okay, go right, left, or stay where you are. Everyone understand? So I'm giving it that extra power. Now your programs can stay where they are. Do you think that adds power to the machine? <laughs> it doesn't add power to the machine. Why not? Because any transition you have that has an S on it, you could replace it with a transition that moves to the right, leaves the tape the way it is, and then moves right back to where it was, moving left, leaving the tape where it is. You just simulate that single transition with two transitions that go to the right and then to the left. And you can mechanically take any program that has these S's in there that means stay the same and convert them to another program that's completely equivalent that has only R's and L's. Do you believe you can do that? All right. Well, the next few things I'm going to try to explain, you're not going to believe so readily because they're harder to explain. But at least that one, I think, is, is a very clear simulation of one machine by the other. So we'll say... Stay put an option. That's no more powerful than a regular Turing machine. Number two, two way infinity. Now the tape looks like this. And the head starts anywhere in the middle. And the input string goes this way. There's blanks. There's blanks on either side of the input. Maybe this gives you more power. What's normal? Normal is that there's an end that you start and it just ended here. And you just go one way infinity. That's normal. So actually, if you ever move off the left end of a regular Turing machine, that's a crash. That's like a division by zero. But here, you never have that problem. You can move any way you want. And look, I could have spun this lecture around because, look, you're beginners, and you're just starting to think about this stuff. And I could have made it seem like the second infinity really gave you extra power. I could have said, hey, that's like one stack, and now this is like two stacks, right? And I go really fast, and you'd say, right. Well, maybe you wouldn't. You, you're, you're all very smart, and you'd probably, but you trust me, too. So that's <laughs> tricky, right? right? You trust me, I can just make things up. So, don't stop trusting me, but the point is, this doesn't give you any extra power. I want to know why. I want you to be skeptical. Why doesn't it give you extra power? How could you manage to simulate any Turing machine that had two-way infinity with a Turing machine that has one-way infinity? I'm going to give you a program that runs on this kind of machine. You've got to convert it to a program that runs on the other kind of machine. Now, this description of how to convert one program to another is not as obvious as the description that you use for number one. And we need kind of